Good evening. It is a great joy and honor to be with you. And after all the great testimonies I heard, I am so inspired and enlightened. And to me, um, this journey here to New Zealand represents a lot because not only because of the Eucharist that I am so close to as all of you are, but also because uh, the celebration of meeting all of you. I'm going to begin by sharing with you a short reading, and I'm reading to you from Galatians 2.1. It says, After 14 years I again went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas and Titus, came with us. Following a revelation, I went to lay before them the gospel that I am preaching to the pagans. I had a private meeting with the leaders, lest I should be working or have worked in a wrong way. But they did not impose circumcision, not even on Titus, who is Greek and who was with me. But there were some intruders and false brothers who had gained access to watch over the way we live, the freedom Christ has given us. They will have us enslaved by the law, but we refused to yield even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel remain intact for you. So this evening I'm here to share with you a story that has changed my life dramatically. And I'm sure each one of you has a great story to share. This moment is my turn. I ask the Holy Spirit to help me to do justice to what the Lord has done in my life. Um, I was born in Colombia, South America, up in the Andes Mountains, in a, a small coffee grower's town. All of my family are coffee growers of many generations, originally from Spain. Um, I grew up with all the Catholic uh, traditions and teachings of the church, and uh, I am number six of ten children. All of my uncles and aunts, they have uh, 18, 20 children each. <laughs> so we were a real Catholic family, like a tribe. And uh, I used to horseback to elementary school. I had a beautiful childhood in the countryside. And uh, when I was 14 years old, I was sent to Bogota, the capital of Colombia, which is a big city, to finish my high school education. And those were the 1960s. And as you know, the 1960s brought about a, a revolution, which I will call it more like a tragedy, because it was the triumphal entrance of all great evils that rule the world today. Not because they were new, but they took over. Uh, like abortion, we've been talking about that extensively and also all of these movements that uh, you know by name. And I embraced a lot of the influences of the 60s and walked away from the Catholic faith, stopped believing that Jesus was God, lost all respect for the Catholic Church, and uh, began practicing all kinds of New Age things like the astrologies and numerologies and the Eastern pagan philosophies and the magic, the occult, all the esoteric sciences. And when I was 19 years old, I got married in Bogota and moved to Germany, to the city of Hamburg. There I went to school at the University of Hamburg and became an actor and a musical composer. Uh, my two sons were born there. And after a little over six years, I moved to uh, California, to Los Angeles, California, and got engaged in the entertainment industry. Uh, shortly after, I was signed to Sony Music of New York, that was known then as CVS Records, as an exclusive artist. And I had a band called Santa Fe, which was a crossover band. And we traveled the world doing concerts and composing music. And I continue also all around the industry, writing scripts and, and uh, acting in movies and theater, and continue uh, delving into all these new age practices. And you probably know that California is probably the world's capital of new age. 
every new age prophet is, is there, you know. And <laughs> so I was like in a paradise. The only one that will bring sense to my life related to God was my mother. She used to visit me in California once a year, and uh, she will tell me, I'm not very impressed with your success or your money. I'm very concerned about your soul. If you die living the life you're living, you are going to be condemned. And that will ring deep in my soul, but I will not obey her. I will just make fun of, of that, and, and I will uh, continue living the life I was living and practicing all this darkness. I thought I was very spiritual. Little did I know, I did have a spirituality, but it was satanic, as I can say today. Um, in year 97, I went to Colombia during Christmas, and that, that Christmas was the Christmas that absolutely changed my life forever. Uh, there was uh, a, a very dark moment in the family because within the four years prior to that Christmas, five dear people in the family had died one after another. First, my wife died to cancer. A few months later, my younger brother uh, died in an accident in a boat in the Bahamas. And uh, shortly after, my father passed away. A few months later, another brother of mine committed suicide in Bogota. And three months later, my mother passed away. So that Christmas, we were four sisters and me left. And my sisters were practicing Catholics. And they had no idea how far gone I was from the faith. And one of the sisters was convinced that at the pace we were going, it seems as if God was going to take all of us pretty soon. So she thought she was going to be the next one to die because she was the only one ill of us five. So she asked us if we could join her to go to church to pray the Divine Infant's Christmas Novena which is a very old Catholic tradition in Colombia. And uh, I had practiced that novena, that devotion, up until I was 14 years old. That's how long I was a Catholic. But I was 47 years old that Christmas, 33 years since I didn't walk into a Catholic church. I actually persecuted Christians. I wrote plays ridiculing uh, the existence of hell and sin. That was me. But I went to church with them just to please them. So when I got to church, the priest introduced the novena saying, he who prays the novena with devotion and faith will be granted a grace by the baby Jesus. So that sounded very attractive to me. I said, maybe I can get something out of this because I was like an opportunist and I was all into magic and powers and, and to me that church and all the, the novena sounded like magical to me, nothing to do with God. So I asked my sister next to me, and how powerful is this baby? So she, <laughs> she gave me all kinds of testimonies as to the wonder the baby will do, especially during that novena. So I said to myself, I'm going to ask this baby to change my life. But, but you probably imagine the type of change of life I asked the baby Jesus. I, I wanted more of what I had, more of the world. And, uh, you know, God uses any chance he's got to rescue a sinner as lost as I was. And he rescued me that Christmas. Uh, the novena begins on the 16th of December and ends on the 24th of December at midnight mass. And uh, the 25th, Christmas Day, I decided to go to the hometown, my hometown, where I was born up in the mountains, which is about an hour away from the city where my sisters live, where I prayed the novena. And I spent Christmas Day just partying away, just drinking, dancing, nothing to do with God. At midnight, I decided to spend the night at a coffee ranch plantation of one of my uncles in the outskirts of town. And I was driving a Jeep, like a Land Cruiser. As I crossed the gate of the ranch, six guys jumped out of the woods with machine guns and kidnapped me. And I fell in the hands of the FARC rebels of Colombia. I was kidnapped for a ransom. And this is a long story. 
about the guerrillas because they have been after my family for years. Thanks God, now they are pretty defeated, but then they were powerful. And uh, so that was the beginning of the chains of life the Lord brought to my life. Uh, you probably know about God's sense of humor. So I, I was there, you know, shocked, and you probably imagine how scary that could be. They tied my hands in the back, they put a hood over my head, wrapped the rope around my waist like the ones they use for the cattle, and took me captured to the jungle. Uh, I could hear them talking that the army was around somewhere monitoring guerrilla activities. So they needed to internate me as deep as they could during the night in the jungle so that they couldn't find me during the day because they, they, I heard they had helicopters. And sure enough, the farmers that witnessed the kidnapping alerted the police and then the army began searching for me. And these guys were rushing me through the woods all night. I, was, I didn't know I was in the hands of guerrillas. Uh, I thought I was rough and they were going to kill me in the woods and well, so one thing led to another. Before sunrise, I was put away in a cave already deep in the jungle. They threw me in there, tied up and still with a hood over my head. And that cave was infested with all kinds of bats and bugs of all kinds that were biting me everywhere. I couldn't even scratch. I was tied up and uh, I knew that the guys had a plan to deliver me to another group of guerrillas that were in charge of keeping me deep in the jungle until I paid the ransom. But that plan fell because the army continued looking for me for a few days. So they couldn't make any moves and they didn't bring any food. And so they will feed me once a day as they will pull me out of the cave and feed me with whatever they could find, like wild roots, wild fruits, whatever water they will find, and they, those guys are used to, to survive like that in case of emergencies. But imagine, I wasn't. And, and so I was growing weaker, more desperate, angrier, because all I had in my heart was hatred towards them, and most of the time I just wanted to die, because it was so horrible, I could never describe it to you. So on the day 15, altogether I was kidnapped for six months, but the first the first uh, 15 days I was in that cave. So on the day 15, they took me out of the cave late at night, and, and uh, I found myself in the midst of a lot of young rebels uh, armed to the teeth. And one of them told me he was the commander and ran down to me all the conditions of the kidnapping. I was to pay them a pretty high ransom. If I were to, uh, not to pay them, they would kill all my sisters, all of my sisters. And, and you probably imagine all the psychological torture and all the stories they were telling me. Um, then at the end they said, because I had seen the faces of those guys that took me to the jungle, I was not to make it out alive. They were going to kill me as soon as I paid the ransom. So they sentenced me to death. And uh, then they told me that night I was to spend in the cave and the next day they were going to transfer me somewhere else. So they tied me up again, put the hood back on my head and threw me back in the cave. So that night was the night where my life was changed forever. I experienced a mystical experience with God that I will not be able to describe it to you in a hundred years. Um, the beginning of the experience, we can call it like an illumination of my conscience. What I went through that night lasted about eight or nine hours, but you couldn't possibly measure it spiritually. Um, I went through what a person goes through when, when one dies, only that I return, and, and only God knows why. I, what I'm gonna relate to you after this moment uh, it's something so incredible and so unbelievable that I can only say this. I went through this not because I am anybody special, because if, if, if I am someone here tonight, is the most unworthy human being to be talking about God before all of you. Because I persecuted the church. I made fun of Christians. I went against God for so many years. And still the Lord not only rescued me 
and rescue me from, from eternal damnation if I had died during that ordeal of the kidnapping. He also set me free from the guerrillas and gave me another chance. So I am here to testify on God's mercy, compassion, and forgiveness. That is my witness. The last thing I want to do is to speak about me, because if I were to share with you about me, I would have to tell you how bad I have been all my life. But now, my life has changed. In the beginning of the experience, the mystical experience, is like an illumination of my conscience, where I am completely destroyed as a human being. And there's no hope of me making it out alive of that cave. My whole life is destroyed. The biggest God I ever had uh, up until that moment was money. And they were going to take all my money. And there was, in, it wasn't going to rescue my life. And, and so many other things that, were, that crumbled to the ground. And at that moment is when God walked into my life. I began to see myself at age three. And I was in the backyard of the house where I was born in my hometown. I was on a tricycle with a stick in my hand, just going through the, through the gardens, hitting the plants and damaging the flowers. And I could hear like a maid telling me not to do that. I was so scared. I just tried to run out of the cave because I was completely awake and conscious in the cave. And I was 47 years old that night. At the same time, I was reliving my infancy perfectly. So if you can imagine something more strange than that. So when I thought about walking out of the cave, I realized if I do that, they will kill me thinking I'm escaping. So I couldn't even move. I had to go through this. And I continue reliving my life little by little. At the beginning, I thought because I had been beaten by so many bugs and animals in that cave for 15 days. I thought my blood was poison and I, I was surely hallucinating. But that didn't help me because it was my own life I was reliving. And if someone knew about hallucinations, it was me that went through the 60s, right? So now I knew it was real. And I continue going through this. And when I was going through age 12, 13, 14, 15, I began to go through the most excruciating pain. And it wasn't physical pain. It was a spiritual pain, deep spiritual pain. It was the pain of my sins. And you know, I told you at first in the beginning that I didn't believe in sin. But there I was. I was going through all these areas that were dark in my life where I did so many wrong things. And as I grew older in the experience, it was getting deeper and deeper the pain. And not only was I going through what I did wrong, my sins, also I was witnessing, reliving the goodness in my life. But what was good was flowing by painlessly. And what was wrong was there like frozen, like it was never gonna go. And I had to suffer each one of those sins. I pretty much think, that I went through my whole life. As I told you, I was 47 years old. All of a sudden, something even more mysterious happened. This first part that I briefly narrated to you, because if I were to give you details, I'd keep you here for years. But this first part, somehow, I had like a grip on reality because I was awake and conscious in that cave. Even though it was so mysterious to go through my life, Still, the fact that I was awake and conscious in the cave gave me like a, like a hope that something was still under control. But now, all of a sudden, that being awake and conscious in the cave was gone. And I appeared face down against the grass on what ended up being a pretty high mountain. And it, I was in the midst of such an amazing silence I never experienced in my life. I will call it a perfect silence. It was a perfect state of joy, peace, and freedom. But freedom not only from the guerrillas, freedom also from this earthly life. And I felt free at last. And then I began to see another mountain far away ahead of me. And on top of that mountain, I could perfectly see the most incredibly beautiful, extraordinary city of light. And 
Though it was so far away from me, I was able to perfectly see it inside and out. No matter how much I have tried to explain what I went through by seeing that city, I have never been able to put it in words. But during the whole mystical experience, I was in a perfect state of knowledge. I will understand everything that was taking place. And I knew my soul had to have been there in the city of light and didn't make it. And then at that very moment, I began to hear the voice of the Lord speak to me, God's voice. His voice so immense, so gigantic, that it seemed to come from everywhere in the whole universe. It seemed to come from inside me. And it was the most magnificent, loving, forgiving, uh, merciful voice ever. And I couldn't stand it. It was burning me. I just wanted that voice to silent. I didn't want to hear it. I wanted to run away from it. And then I rejected it. And some people have a hard time believing that a soul, when leaving this body, will, will reject God. I did. See, when you grow up without love, without the love of God, you are not able to stand before the love of God. You're not able to bear with it. And I did that. So the Lord silenced. He stopped talking to me. And at that moment, everything disappeared. The mountains, that city of light, his voice vanished, and I found myself floating on top of a terrifying abyss. And I knew where I was, but I didn't want to face it. As I told you, for 33 years, I denied the existence of hell. And I knew I was floating on top of hell. Tonight, before all of you, I testify with my life that hell does exist. Not because I read it in a book, because when I read it in the Catholic Catechism, I made fun of it all of my life. And not because a human being revealed it to me, because when I was told about the existence of hell at school, in church, at home, I made fun of it. But tonight, I'm no longer making fun of it. And it's going to sound very strange what I'm going to tell you, but only God knows is the truth. I know the existence of hell because I have been there. Why? I have no answers for that. Only God knows. But this is the truth. You probably imagine that it will be impossible to describe a supernatural experience in a natural language. So I will not be able to give you a perfect idea of what I went through. But I give you just a very small view of it. I am floating on top of what appeared to be at first like an ocean of fog, like dirty, thick fog. And I began to sink in it. Once I was inside, I realized it wasn't fog. Every particle of it was a condemned soul, a demonized human being. I knew they, were all hu they had been human beings, only they were totally deformed by sin. And I was able to understand every deformity. I knew exactly which sins have inflicted which deformities. And this goes on and on because I was seeing all of this reality. And I could feel the anger and the despair and the hatred. And they wanted to, to, to scream that, but all these animal sounds, bestial sounds would come out of them and that would make them even angrier. But though they were in voices, I, could, I understood everything they were saying, which is even more mysterious. As I looked deeper in the abyss, I could see there were uncountable levels of condemnation, depending of, of, the, of the scenes they, they fell uh, into, the, into this, that pit. And then when I looked deeper down, I could see there were hierarchies, like demonic hierarchies formed by spirits that have never been human beings that we know as fallen angels. Every hierarchy was ruling a different area of sin. And I could see how I was connected to all of these forces during all those territory years that I lived in mortal sin. And uh, this is a very long experience but the Lord spoke to me again, and I appeared back 
face down against the grass on that mountain where I had torn him down. And uh, he spoke to me at length. I could speak about that for years. I written eight books. I developed about 800 uh, mystical themes based on all this experience during all my years of missioning. And still I haven't even touched the surface. Among the things I can share with you in these few minutes, the Lord spoke to me about humanity. And he said to me, we are going through a very dark spiritual time. And he also said that we are at the very end of the end of the end of the end times. And it's not because I came here to give you a message of end times. I'm far from being a messenger like that. But the Lord was speaking about the last battle between good and evil for the souls that are here and the ones that still are to come to complete the economy of salvation. And then he spoke to that number of the economy of salvation and he spoke about his perfect plan. And then he spoke about salvation and he said salvation is for every human being he creates. And as St. John of the Cross said, that's exactly what he said. He says, at the end of this life, we will be judged on love before the tribunal of Jesus Christ, who is the judge of all of humanity. Salvation can only be achieved through Jesus Christ. All of us, regardless of who we are, the Hindus, the Buddhists, the, the Jews, the Muslims, the Christians, as soon as we come out of this body, we will face the tribunal of Jesus, and he will be our judge. But the judgment will be on love. But those who have received most, they will be asked most back. And he said, I was created, and that is the word he used. I was created to be a Catholic. And he said, the Catholic Church is his church, the continuation of Judaism. And he said, the Jews are our elderly brothers. And I have to look up to that. He said, he said that we are founded on Judaism. And uh, we are the continuation, the fulfillment of Judaism. And, and he said, the last sign we ever get before the second coming of Jesus is that overnight, with no explanation whatsoever, overnight, the Jews will convert into Catholicism. And they will be the chosen ones also to prepare the second coming, as they were the chosen ones to prepare the incarnation of Jesus. And they will rescue the church from a great apostasy. Now, he said to me that the Catholic Church is the mother of souls. We are in charge of all souls of all humanity. And he said, we are Eucharistic reparation instruments. And then because of the Eucharist, we are feeding all of humanity with the bread of life, with the Eucharist. So he showed me the Eucharist and he said, the devil stole from me the Catholic Church at age 14. And when he stole from me the sacrament of confession. So he said, because I was created a Eucharistic reparation instrument, I am to survive on the sacraments. And the only way I can prepare this heart to be able to be an instrument of the Eucharist is through reconciliation constantly. I have to keep it humble and docile and soft by confession. Because he said, because of the law that is in us that tends us to sin because of original sin, we have a tendency to go towards sin. The sacrament of confession was given to us by Jesus in order for us to keep this instrument prepared to be the instruments of the Eucharist. So he said, confession is vital. And he said, the middleman is given to us for a big reason, to keep us humble. Because, you know, sin is the throne of pride. And the only way to tear down the throne of pride in our hearts is to kneel and confess our sins to another sinner who is the priest. But if the instrument of God chosen and anointed to deliver us from the forces of evil, because he said only the church has the power to unchain us from the powers of evil contracted by sin. So he said every mortal sin is guarded by a fallen angel. And the angel will not obey anyone else but the church. That's why Jesus gave the key to heaven 
to Peter. So the church has the key to release us, untie us, to deliver us from evil when we repent, when we kneel and confess our sins. It's a deliverance. And it's the only way we can be free from the devil. He will not obey anybody else but the church. So this sacrament of, of confession is the most incredible gift we have ever received as Catholics, but also the greatest responsibility. So he said, when we take communion, we actually become tabernacles of the living God. The same God that spoke to Moses. That God we find in the tabernacle. When Moses would come down from speaking to God, his face was so lit up, the Hebrews had to put a veil on his face in order to talk to him. They couldn't bear with the light. And that same God is the God that we have in the Eucharist. This magnificent God that shines from above. And then he said to me that when we come to church to take communion, at the moment we take communion and we are in grace with God, at peace and reconciled with God, absolved by the church, we are these living tabernacles of God and the Lord Christifies us, turns us into another Christ. And at that very moment, the Lord is able to rescue souls at the moment of communion. He says, Someone could be dying at that very moment in danger of condemnation. And because of the communion that we took at peace with God, being prepared, perfectly prepared, the Lord is able to rescue that soul through our communion. When he showed me the 33 years that I didn't take communion, you cannot even imagine the pain I was going through. To see all of the souls that could have been rescued if I would have been faithful to God and if I would have fulfilled the mission I was created to fulfill. It was very painful. The greatest pain of a Catholic when dying is to see all the wasted Eucharist. I was big, our biggest mission in this life, the biggest mission is to be faithful, simple Catholics Faithful to the Eucharist. This is our duty. The Lord will do the rest. Once you walk out of the church after communion, the things that happen when you walk out, how all this incredible power of God radiates out of our hearts. And the Lord will heal the sick. The Lord will deliver people, and we don't even know it. We will see that when we come before his tribunal, the day he will call us. Now it will be impossible to understand it, but this is our main, main duty. So that's why I'm so honored to be here, because there is no greater gift than the Eucharist. So this gathering honors the greatest of all, which is the greatest gift. And now I could keep you about the Eucharist forever, because this is endless, what he showed me about it. He, he ran all of the commandments, all of the sacraments, the sacred traditions of the church, how important it was to understand sane doctrine. And he said, the closer we get to the end, the toughest the battle, because the devil is going to work on watering down all of our sacred traditions. And he explained to me how important it was to be obedient to church hierarchy. How important it was to acknowledge the seat of Peter, the Pope, to understand what it means and how important it is to combat against evil by being obedient. If you are perfectly aligned with obedience, the devil is, doesn't have any way to get you, only to tempt you, but has no power over you because obedience is the only weapon to hit him because obedience will make you humble. And he is the throne of pride, and humbleness will destroy the devil. So now, he said to me, he placed me in a state of purgatory. I appeared in a lake with the water up to my waist. And I, in front of the lake, there was a magnificent rock, gigantic. The distance between the rock and the lake could easily be the distance between the sun and the, and the earth. It was very far, but everything was so instantaneous there. I, I am there in that lake and I knew Jesus is in that rock, but I knew I couldn't see him because of the state of sin I was in. So I tried to escape in the water. And when I tried to do that, I realized 
I was standing in the midst of all of my sins of 33 years. And my sins were spirits. They, they were spirits of evil. And I, my soul knew each one of them. Each one of them. When I would look at one of them, I could see the moment I was tempted, the moment I consented the temptation and contracted a sin, and the consequence of, of, of that particular sin, how it had affected my whole family, generations to come, souls in purgatory, had diminished the graces of the whole church. And it was so devastating. If we only knew the pain souls in purgatory go through, we will pray for them every day of our lives. But one thing we have to know, souls in purgatory are light years ahead of us. They will not like to come back here. It's like me wanted to come back into the womb of my mother. I wouldn't like that. So they wouldn't like to come back here, but they still have to resolve earthly life in many areas. And that's why they linger around in different levels. So there are many degrees, many levels of purgatory. If we could see the spiritual realm for a second, you will be amazed as to the millions of souls that didn't make it quite all the way up there. They are slowly going up as they resolve earthly life. But they are in a beautiful state of being, but in a very deep pain because it's not easy to bear with a perfect state of conscience, pure intellect. That's what they are in. So, and I, that is a very long and deep experience what I went through in purgatory. The Lord gave me the strength to look at the rock. When I looked at the rock, I was blinded by the light and I, I knew that whole light was Jesus, but I never thought I could ever see him. And he began to appear to me. The first thing I saw were his two hands like this. And I knew he was calling me in. And I couldn't move from the lake, not even an inch, towards him. And then he spoke to me from the light and he said to me, The door is open. I'm inviting you in, but you can't come in because you are empty of my love. I'm going to teach you how to trust in my mercy. You have never loved with my love. And he gave me an incredible long lesson about love. And he explained to me how God created us with love. And the only possible nourishment of the soul is the love of God. And the love of God will not flow through us unless we love our neighbor unconditionally. The only way we can strengthen our soul and feed our soul is when we love one another unconditionally. And then he made that very clear. And he said, we are in a spiritual gestation. So as a mother is pregnant with a baby and is careful that that baby will be delivered on the ninth month and will take care of that baby and feed that baby, right? That's how we should do with our soul. Our soul is like a baby in, the, in this womb of the flesh. And it should be delivered at the end of this life on God's time to the fullness of the spiritual realm. But it better be healthy. And the health of that baby soul could only be achieved with the love of God that flows through us to one another. It's the only way to feed ourselves. I never loved anyone with the love of God. Therefore, I was paralyzed in that lake. So the Lord gave me the incredible gift of looking through his eyes. The first appearance I, I saw of Jesus' face was as a baby, baby Jesus. And through his eyes, I could see an endless ocean of purity. And I knew that whole ocean was made, formed by spirits of God that I knew had been human beings and they were in the glory of God. I'm sure the vision I had of the glory of God is probably the smallest vision one could ever have because of the state of sin I was in. But I guarantee you that if you could see a little dot of the little dot I saw the glory of God, you will spend the rest of your life on your knees. I was never the same person after that. I was dramatically changed forever. I had experience with Our Lady also through the eyes of our Lord, and she showed me she was my mother. She had never left me, and she would not leave me. And then 
I appear in her womb as a baby connected to her through an umbilical cord, like a spiritual cord. And everything that was flowing out of my heart towards the Lord Jesus was flowing through her womb. And what was coming from heaven towards me was flowing through her womb into my heart. And she showed me amazing things about the angels and the role of the angels in our lives and, and the, the, the importance of obedience and humility and, and how drastic it was for us, the battle we are confronted with now, the spiritual warfare with this materialistic world. Now, the Lord sent me back. I had convulsions as if I came into a prison. I, I spent five and a half months more keeping up after that vision with God. And all I was asking the Lord every day was not to let me die without confession. That was my biggest request. Six months later, a big miracle occurred. And without explanation, I was taken to a road in the middle of the night and uh, set free there with no explanation. The guerrillas told me to walk straight and not to look back. That was the longest walk of my life. I, I was sure they were going to shoot me from the back because I was sentenced to death, but they just left me there. And after a long walk, uh, an old bus shot up. I was picked up after a struggle because I had the beard down to my chest, the same clothes I wore for six months, all tear apart. They thought I was like a madman that came out of the woods. But I made it into the bus. They took me back to civilization. My sister picked me up. As soon as I recouped a little physically, I went to confession at a Franciscan monastery in the city of my sisters. You probably imagine how long my confession was. Then I went back to California to my home in Los Angeles, and I spent two years in silence. I was back in church, madly in love with the Catholic Church, because as I begin reading the catechists, the scriptures, and all, all, all doctors of the church. I was so fascinated because I have known the church through the Lord. And now it was being confirmed to me by the things I was reading. So, but I didn't know I had a mission. Two years later, during a Holy Week on Palm Sunday, by, while visiting in Colombia, I had experience with the Lord Jesus from a crucifix during noon mass and the Lord showed me the mission I was to fulfill. So I walked away from my career, founded a mission called Pilgrims of Love with the Archdiocese of Bogota 13 years ago and I have been traveling the world ever since. The Lord told me every place I'm going to go to he had already chosen and every person that was going to listen to me he had already chosen by name. And this is what I've been doing. I live in faith and I have never lacked a thing, not even a minute of my life, since I became a lay Catholic missionary. Thank you. <clears throat>